I am pleased to welcome Dr. Laura Gelfman for her grand rounds on palliative care in patients with heart failure. Dr. Gelfman received her medical degree here at Mount Sinai. She then went on to complete her residency at New York Hospital Cornell and then came back here from Mount Sinai for her palliative care training and also received her MPH during her fellowship. Dr. Gelfman's current research is in the use of palliative care interventions to improve the quality of life in patients with congestive heart failure. Dr. Gelfman has multiple publications in this area and continues to practice and currently holds the title of Assistant Professor in Geriatrics and Palliative Care here at Mount Sinai. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Laura Gelfman. Good morning, everyone, and thank you so much um, for inviting me to speak today. It's a true privilege to be here, particularly because I was a Mount Sinai medical student, and I very vividly remember sitting in those seats a little long ago than I'd like to perhaps acknowledge. <laughs> um, I have no financial disclosures, and before I get started with the content of my talk, I'd really like to extend a tremendous thanks. Um, I owe a tremendous debt of gratitude to my mentors, including Nate Goldstein, Sean Morrison, Rebecca Sudori, and Diane Meyer, as well as my collaborators. Um, I'm so lucky to work with the tremendous advanced heart failure team here at Mount Sinai, who have supported all of our various both clinical and research collaborations with palliative care. And so I want to, in particular, thank Sean Pinney for his vision um, in his collaboration with palliative care, the enthusiasm of um, Anu Lala, um, as well as the entire advanced heart failure team. I'd also like to thank my collaborators, including Harriet Mather, Karen McKendrick, and Yol Yolanda Baranvaya, and as well as the NIA, who supports, um, who funds me with the K23, looking at ways to improve the integration of palliative care and heart failure. So this morning, I have three objectives. The first is to really review the spectrum of palliative care for patients with heart failure. Next, to describe the current evidence base we have for palliative care for patients with heart failure. And then finally, to propose some opportunities for integrating primary and specialty palliative care into the care of these patients. So what are the palliative care needs of patients with heart failure? Well, first, before we delve into that, I'd like to focus on uh, ensure that we're on the same page in terms of what palliative care is. Palliative care is specialized medical care for patients who are facing serious illness, with a focus on improving the quality of life for both patients and their families by providing relief from the symptoms and stress of serious illness. And as you can see in the diagram, palliative care ideally would be initiated at diagnosis of serious illness, continuing along disease-directed therapies, and then taking on a more prominent role towards the end of life. So why is this relevant to heart failure? Well, heart failure has a vast prevalence with nearly 7 million patients living in the United States with heart failure, which makes up about 2.5% of our overall population. The incidence of heart failure is about 550,000 patients per year, with a mortality of approaching 300,000 patients per year. And with this tremendous prevalence comes a large um, utilization of healthcare between inpatient and outpatient visits. Um, overall, the costs uh, attributed to heart failure across the healthcare system exceed near, um, $30 billion per year, and that's billion with a B. So palliative care, how, what are the needs of palliative care patients in heart failure? Well, heart failure confers a prognosis that is worse than many types of cancer, with stage D or advanced heart failure having a mortality, one-year mortality approaching 50%. Yet, few patients actually receive palliative care. Uh, studies suggest that less than 10% of patients with heart failure receive palliative care, and when looking across all hospice admissions, less than 12% of hospice admissions are for patients with a primary diagnosis of heart failure. With this, the evidence base uh, for palliative care and heart failure lags behind that of cancer. So why can't the evidence base that we do have for cancer just be applied to heart failure? Well, as you can see here, these diagrams show the distinctions in the clinical trajectory of these two illnesses. And so where you look at cancer, where patients' functional status, uh, when patients' functional status declines, that is an indication that the patients may be approaching the end of life. 
However, when looking at heart failure, you can see which e with each subsequent heart failure exacerbation, patients with optimal management may return to their prior functional status or close to their prior functional status. Um, and this cycle may continue uh, with many exacerbations, making it very hard to predict sort of what their clinical trajectory will look like. And with advanced therapies, it's no longer quite as simple as adding aspirin as one of your pizza toppings. We now have tremendous um, spread of different therapies that allow us to replace, remodel, reprogram, and repair the heart with things like uh, mechanical circulatory support and transplant, which really has changed this clinical trajectory where patients who are um, in the diagram on the right at point four in their clinical trajectory with these therapies, they can really go backwards in time in many respects, improving both their quality of life and survival, which again contributes to the uncertainty and unpredictability of this clinical trajectory. And this unpredictability and uncertainty persists even when patients are receiving things like advanced therapies, including destination therapy, LVADs. In this study, um, which Shannon Dunley at the Mayo looked at what the clinical trajectory is for patients who receive destination therapy, LVADs, you can see that in the green and yellow, about 70% of these patients have a tremendous clinical improvement after receipt of the device. Uh, about 40% of these patients have an acute death after that clinical improvement, and another 30% have a more gradual decline. Yet you can also see about 10% of these patients have an early post-operative death, and 20% are faced with a consistent, uh, persistent organ failure, um, heart or otherwise. And so this demonstrates really that even those patients who are getting that, those advanced therapies also face a tremendous amount of unpredictability. And so with all these therapies, we've been really been able to shift the trajectory um, and really elongate it. Whereas you can see in the upper diagram, it used to be that patients went uh, more precipitously from stage B to stage C to stage D heart failure. Now you can see in the diagram below that this trajectory has really um, elongated with all these therapies. And so with this, as patients live longer, more patients uh, experience heart failure, Furthermore, with improved therapies such as uh, management of acute MI, patients survive longer. And then with particular management of heart failure itself, patients survive longer. And so overall, the projected prevalence of heart failure by 2030 is going to be over 8 million people. So what I've shown so far is really that in spite of um, the data we have about this illness, it's very hard to predict sort of where patients are on their trajectory. What we do have is um, rehospitalization is actually a, a good marker for mortality. And in this study, which they looked at a, a cohort of patients um, from British Columbia who um, had subsequent heart failure hospitalizations, they found that overall, after adjusting for age and comorbidities, that the median survival after one heart failure hospitalization was just under two and a half years. And that dramatically decreased when you go forward into looking at after their fourth heart failure hospitalization with a survival of just over half a year. And then when you look at different sub subsamples, you can look at those patients who had concomitant chronic kidney disease or advancing age, uh, the survival was much worse. So now moving ahead and thinking about what is the evidence base that we actually have for palliative care and heart failure? Well, there was a study that was published in 2017 by Joe Rogers Group at Duke, and this was a single center randomized control trial looking at comparing a palliative care nurse practitioner-led intervention uh, versus usual care. And these patients were enrolled who were identified to have both advanced heart failure as well as a high risk for mortality. And these patients were enrolled if they were either recently hospitalized uh, or they are hospitalized or recently discharged. And so this palliative care nurse practitioner um, initiated a consultation at enrollment and then continued to follow these patients for six months. And what this study showed is that those patients who received the intervention um, had more improvements in terms of their quality of life, anxiety, depression, and spiritual well-being without any difference in their rehospitalization or mortality numbers. <laughs> 
And another intervention that was conducted at the Brigham of a social worker-led palliative care intervention with a focus on advanced care planning, in this pilot randomized control trial of 50 patients, patients were randomized to have a cardiology social work um, intervention. Um, and again, these patients were followed for six months. Um, at the end of the study, it was found that the patients who received the intervention had a statistically significant increase in the number of documented advanced care preferences, as well as improved prognostic alignment. And so prognostic alignment really means that both the physician and the patient are more concordant in their perception of what their prognosis is. And so I just want to uh, note that in, at enrollment, the physicians um, reported that the prognosis of the patients enrolled was less than a year in 64% of the patients. Whereas at enrollment, the patients predicted their own prognosis to be greater than five years in 84% of these patients. So at enrollment, there was a tremendous discrepancy between the physician and patient's perception of their prognosis, and that gap um, diminished in the uh, intervention group. At six months, there was no measured difference in the groups between depression, anxiety, or quality of life. Now moving on to some of our work here, in which we um, analyzed a group of Medicare beneficiaries who had two or more heart failure hospitalizations within six months, to look at some of what are the associations between patient characteristics and subsequent hospice enrollment. And here you can see um, that we, our hypothesis was that patients who were more symptomatic or who had a worse functional status would be more likely to enroll in hospice. And what we found is actually it's much more random than that. That, um, as you can see here, both the usual care and hospice group have very similar reported rates of dyspnea and pain. And though there's statistical difference in the number of um, ADL and IADL dependencies, when you look at the numbers clinically, there's no real clinical difference between a 4.1 and 3.8. What we do see are the differences that persist across all diagnoses in those patients who enroll in hospice or not, with those who enroll in hospice being older, are less likely to be black, more less likely to have Medicaid, have a lower mean income, more likely to have cancer and dementia. So really what this shows us is that symptoms and functional status are not actually associated with hospital, hospice enrollment as we expected. We also looked uh, forward at this group of patients with two or more heart failure hospitalizations in six months and looked at those who died within six months after that second heart failure hospitalization and found that those who received hospice had a longer survival with a median number of days of uh, survival from that second heart failure hospitalization of 80 days in the hospice group and only 71 days in the usual care group. We looked at a different sample of uh, patients uh, who had two or more heart failure hospitalizations within two months and looked at sort of what, what their actual trajectory was and the pattern of actual hospice enrollment. And we found that nearly 40% of these patients enrolled in hospice within seven days of that second heart failure hospitalization. Um, and then, um, meaning the vast majority are enrolling um, very close to death. They, are only, they only received um, less than seven days of hospice care, with the overall median number of days of hospice care being 15. And other studies have shown us that the patients, this is really too short of a time for patients to actually receive the benefits of hospice, meaning that these patients are enrolling in hospice too close to death. In spite of this relatively limited evidence base, the major cardiology and heart failure societies all promote the incorporation of palliative care into the patients with stage D heart failure. Um, and in this slide, you can see guidelines promoted by the American College of Cardiology, the American Heart Association, the International Society for Heart Lung Transplantation, the European Society of Cardiology, as well as the Heart Failure Society of America, all promoting incorporation of palliative care for patients with um, end stage heart failure. So why is there not more research? Well, this is something that um, I started looking at back when I was a Mount Sinai medical student, um, looking at research funding and trying to better understand um, the sources of funding for palliative care. And we found looking at the sources of funding back in 2001 to 2005, that more than a quarter of publications in palliative medicine were uh, published without any funding and less than a third of those were supported by the NIH, meaning the vast majority of this palliative medicine research 
back in the early 2000s was being um, done either without any support or with the support of foundations. We continued to follow this, looking ahead to 2006 to 2010, and found that there was a tremendous boom in the number of uh, original research publications in palliative medicine. And perhaps most excitingly, looking recently, this work done by one of our Mount Sinai medical students, that there was tremendous growth in the amount of palliative medicine research being published in non-palliative medicine journals, meaning that there's been a tremendous growth in the dissemination of palliative medicine research outside of palliative medicine to areas like cardiology, oncology, pulmonology, as well as a growth in the number of NIH grants that are going to junior um, investigators. So when this was drilled down a bit deeper, again, this is actually work done by one of our Mount Sinai interns, um, Kira G, where she looked more specifically at NIH funding for palliative care and heart failure, and found that of the $45 billion that are, um, the NIH funding goes to heart failure, less than 14 million went to palliative medicine. And with that, looking at specifically drilling down to NHLBI, the National Heart Lung Blood Institute, um, looking at their funding for um, heart failure, less than 0.1% of that went towards palliative care. And so this may be one of the explanations for why the evidence is lagging. Yet, it's important to note we do have an evidence base and it is growing, and so how can we put that into practice? Well, in this diagram, we illustrate sort of how, how palliative medicine can be offered across the whole heart failure experience. With the diagram in the red being traditional heart failure management, including um, things like diagnostic testing and evaluation, appropriate management of um, offering of various different therapies, communication of prognosis, and overall monitoring of physical function and quality of life as the illness trajectory uh, continues. With the goal that primary palliative care can be offered in tandem with this traditional heart failure management. And when I say primary care, primary palliative care, I mean palliative care that can be offered by the primary team. Meaning, in certainly at Mount Sinai, the interdisciplinary team including physicians, nurses, nurse practitioners, uh, social workers, and those primary palliative care um, domains include all the palliative care domains of pain and symptom management, assistance with decision making and advanced care planning, uh, support to the family to reduce the emotional distress of facing a serious illness, and coordinating care across the entire team. And then specialty palliative care would take, um, take part when the cases are particularly complex or um, severe. And so we're really lucky to be at a place where this integration is so um, tremendous. The advanced heart failure team and our palliative care team have integrated so uh, wonderfully. And so I'd like to take a moment to give a big shout out to my team uh, for all the work that they do in helping take care of patients um, and families and um, certainly have learned a tremendous amount from you all, as well as the advanced heart failure team. Um, what you might not realize is that the, um, our teams are quite integrated. We're one of the members of the palliative care team every Tuesday morning attends the ventricular assist device transplant eligibility committee um, that's held. We have, um, we see all the patients who receive destination therapy LVADs. And most recently, we've been lucky enough to incorporate Karen Hainch, who's um, an embedded palliative care nurse practitioner who works literally embedded within the heart failure team, primarily in the outpatient, inpatient setting now and we'll be moving into the outpatient setting going forward. And so we're lucky enough to be at a place where this, this trajectory of going from primary and specialty palliative care um, exists, really works really well and closely with the heart failure team here at Mount Sinai. We're also leaders in thinking about ways to improve the integration of palliative care and heart failure. With people like Sean Pinney, Nate Goldstein, and myself led a group of leaders in cardiology, palliative medicine, and geriatrics to create and really set the agenda for integrating palliative care and heart failure, um, thanks to the various funding organizations. And this work continues. So a question that we often get is really, so who, who is the right person to receive specialist palliative care? Well, first, we'd say that uncontrolled and refractory symptoms are certainly an important indicator and uh, patients may, may benefit. 
And then really, I would turn to, back to the question of the uncertainty of this clinical trajectory and those patients who are facing um, this uncertainty. Because palliative care really has a key role in walking sort of hand in hand with the patient um, along that line of thinking sort of the hope for the best, prepare for the worst. And so, you know, some potential triggers to think about uh, calling specialty palliative care are patients you think might die on this hospitalization or patients who you have set up a discharge plan for and you're not really sure that meets their goals and values. Um, again, looking at hospitalizations was a marker for mortality. So patients you've noticed have had two or more heart failure hospitalizations in the past year. Patients you see are just keep coming back and forth between the skilled nursing facility and the hospital and something's just not right in terms of um, their care plan. Or in those patients who, in spite of your best efforts to explain what heart failure looks like and what the future may hold, you're still left with the feeling that the patient and family just don't get it. And so um, because of the benefits of palliative care, actually it's mandated by CMS and the Joint Commission that palliative care sees all patients who, have, who are receiving a destination therapy LVAD. And the goal of these consultations is really to sort of walk that line of the what if. Um, helping patients and families understand the complex trajectory, supporting that primary team, whether it's internal medicine or cardiology, and trying to maintain or improve the quality of life of these patients with a focus on symptom control. Um, the goal is not to help the patient accept that they may be at the end of life. And so symptom management is certainly key to the work that we do. Um, the list of symptoms that heart failure patients face is quite long. And I'll just say, rather than going on the management of each of these symptoms, that the best management for the vast majority of heart failure symptoms is the management of heart failure itself. Um, it's certainly uh, teams like palliative care and psychiatry can be helpful in managing symptoms like depression and anxiety. Um, but really and truly optimizing heart failure management manages overall symptoms. So what we do know is that the vast majority of consults that we receive um, from patients with heart failure are really for having goals of care conversations. In one academic medical center, you can see that the vast majority, 80% of the consults to palliative medicine were for goals of care. Yet we also see that these consults are happening very close to death, with the median time from consult to death was 21 days. So what do goals of care discussions and heart failure look like? Well, taking a step back, what we do know is that goals of care conversations actually improve outcomes in patients with advanced cancer, with patients reported improved quality of life, as well as lower costs of healthcare. And caregivers have improved satisfaction and improved bereavement. Furthermore, patients and families want high quality communication between themselves and their doctors. But what we know is that these are less likely to occur in patients with heart failure, such that patients are often unaware that their illness is life-limiting, as demonstrated by that previous study of the patient's um, prognosis uh, projected to be greater than five years as compared to that of the physicians of less than one year. And in turn, clinicians are often unaware of their patient's treatment preferences. We also know that advanced directives are somewhat limited in terms of their completion in patients with heart failure. When one community-based uh, study of patients with heart failure, only 41% had an um, advanced directive completed, and of those, 90% was a healthcare proxy. When looking particularly at code status preferences, at enrollment of the study, 73% of these patients were full code, and by the end of the study, nearly 80% were DNR. The important thing to note is that that decision that went from full code to DNR occurred about 37 days prior to death, meaning that that conversation is a surrogate of the conversation about goals is happening very late in the illness trajectory. And then looking at a cohort of patients who were hospitalized for heart failure, less than 13% of these patients had a documented advanced directive. Now, this is some work that we're, working at, we're writing up now. Um, this is a randomized control trial, multi-site, um, led by Nate Goldstein, of a clinician-centered communication intervention for patients with advanced heart failure and ICDs. Um, in this study, uh, 557 patients were enrolled who had either stage three or four New York Heart Association class heart failure, as well as a high mortality risk. And what we found is we looked at some of the baseline data and found that 
74% of these patients were told that they could die from their heart failure. Less than a quarter were told when they might die from their heart failure, meaning given a, a prognosis. And only a quarter reported that they discussed their wishes about the care that they would want to receive if they were dying. When moving on to look at their advanced directives at enrollment, 23% had a healthcare proxy, 13% had a living will, and only 2% had a DNR. So why is this so complicated? Well, uh, first looking at some of the patient perceptions of heart failure, we find that patients with heart failure are less likely to believe that they will actually die from their heart failure. One patient in a qualitative interview said, the way I look at it, I don't have an illness. I don't have cancer or anything. I basically have heart failure. You don't call it a sickness or an illness. Furthermore, not all patients want to hear the same information at the same time. And so there's a lot of variability. One patient said, if a doctor told me that my health got worse, I'd walk out and find someone else. Whereas another patient said, I'd like that doctors are upfront with what to expect. Sometimes the news isn't what you want to hear, as long as there's hope. And this is made even harder because the conversations themselves, we know, are really challenging. Um, as one patient perhaps put it best, doctors don't want to give bad news. They don't want to hurt patients. And again, coming back to this uncertainty where patients and physicians and all the clinicians caring for uh, patients with heart failure are faced with this uncertainty. Uh, one clinician said, it's hard for a, the patient and the doctor to say, wait a minute, the pattern's changing, there's more exacerbations, it's more difficult to get this person back from the edge. In particular, when these patients and physicians have already brought these patients back from the edge so many times before. Yet, we also hear from patients is that they want the truth and they want it directly from their doctors. If there's something life-threatening, don't beat around the bush to tell us. Most of the doctors hold back information and tell your daughters instead of the individuals. Yet, it's not always so straightforward. So in this Dilbert cartoon, uh, Dogbert says to Dilbert, here's the first draft in an advanced healthcare directive I wrote for you. And there's Dilbert reading the directive and says, it reads, kill me if I have a headache, kill me if I'm itchy, kill me if I complain too much. Well, Dilbert says, I might have some edits to that. And Dogbert says, there's your complaining again. So because of this complexity, um, Lynn uh, Stevenson and Arden O'Donnell developed this ladder of shared decision making in which you can see things like identification of a healthcare proxy really sit at the lowest rung of this ladder and then taking it stepwise as you go up the ladder in increasing complexity, knowing that these decisions and conversations change over time and um, really require an iterative fashion of, of approaching these decisions. So how can we apply these uh, principles across care settings and what are the potential opportunities for integrating palliative care? Well, our group, for example, in the outpatient setting would take that opportunity to identify things like a healthcare agent and really take the first pass at exploring sort of who the patient is in front, um, in front of you by exploring their goals and values. Some questions you might ask or that we certainly ask are, you know, hearing this news about your heart failure, what's most important to you? Or uh, we often ask, when you look to the future, what are you hoping for? And then to use these opportunities of subsequent heart failure hospitalizations to continue this conversation, to again explore those same goals and values, knowing that they change over time. And then to use that information to help make treatment goals. So you know, a patient who says that I want um, to be out of the hospital as much as possible, you might make one recommendation for, as compared to somebody who says, you know, I have my granddaughter, I want to walk my granddaughter down the aisle in um, six months. And so really to tailor those treatments based on what you're hearing from the patients um, and their families. Um, hospitalization is also another opportunity to complete things like a uh, medical order for life-sustaining treatment. And that's particularly important for patients who are going back and forth between skilled nursing facilities to really make it very clear across care settings sort of what the patient's um, treatment preferences are. And then taking again another opportunity before these patients leave the hospital or perhaps when they see you back in the outpatient setting after a hospitalization, 
um, to continue this conversation about goals and values and really make sure that these conversations that you initiate in the various care settings are able to continue on by picking up the phone or documenting in the EMR under the advanced care planning tab um, what the conversation you had so that that conversation can be continued by other healthcare providers. Another question we get uh, frequently is sort of when do you consider hospice in patients with heart failure? Well, there are two primary criteria. The first being optimally treated for their heart disease or being uh, in, in the context of either declining or not being a candidate for some of these advanced therapies, as well as having class four New York Heart Association heart failure, meaning having symptoms at rest. Some other supportive factors include treatment resistant arrhythmias, a history of cardiac arrest, or a history of unexplained syncope. So hopefully I've made the case to you of why palliative care is important for patients with heart failure. And with that, um, I find that sometimes people ask, well, great, heart palliative care is important, but how do I actually introduce that to my patients? And so I thought it might be helpful to provide you with some language. We're just, we're gonna ask a team to come by and see if there's anything they can help you, help with, to help you live as best as you can with your heart failure. That team is called palliative care. And I can certainly say in my experience and that of my colleagues, it's very rare to have patients turn down an opportunity to live as best as possible. So in summary, patients with heart failure have significant palliative care needs. Heart failure isn't like cancer, so we really have to rethink about the opportunities to integrate palliative care in heart failure. And we need to tailor the palliative care for heart failure to these different populations to improve the quality of care for patients and their families. Thank you. Uh, first of all, thanks very much. Uh, <clears throat> fine presentation. And uh, Mount Sinai, I'm sure, is very proud of you. We have Dr. K sitting in the first row, and he particularly must feel good about seeing one of our students do so well. And now I have a question. Uh, most of your patients appear to be older patients. And you haven't mentioned your view of this, but this is, in a way, a beautiful presentation about older patients with heart failure. Could you comment on that point of view and why you haven't been emphasizing that and so forth? Sure. Um, certainly a large percentage of the patients that we care for, and certainly in these studies, um, look at our older adults with heart failure because so many older adults have heart failure. Um, certainly we provide palliative care across to, to patients at any, with any age, um, any stage. Um, and so we often see patients, young patients as well. I think a lot of these studies particularly looked also at Medicare um, beneficiaries, and so that also pushes um, the age uh, to over than 65. Uh, but yes, yeah, certainly the large number of patients are actually are older adults living with heart failure because that's where, where heart failure lives. Okay, this is a very important lecture for everybody, but particularly for the house staff. So thank you very much for a really comprehensive program. Really appreciate it.